first off, Jared, thank you so much for doing this. I know you're a busy guy. Um, oh, well, no, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, I, I you know, appreciate the opportunity to, you know, have a conversation about, you know, whatever, whatever you guys want to talk about. Okay. So for those of you that, uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know who Jared Beck is, but for, for those of you who don't know, Jared and his wife uh, took the DNC to court uh, over, uh, I guess I'll let you continue on in that story, Jared, if you, if you may. Yeah, I mean, you know, in a nutshell, uh, we, you know, as you say, we took the DNC to court as well as uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was uh, the chair at the time we filed suit, which is, you know, this was back in, uh, uh, actually, um, we filed the case um, uh, right after the Guccifer 2.0 documents came out. So it was even before uh, WikiLeaks, um, you know, just, uh, you know, unloaded reams of documents which showed that, uh, you know, the, the fix was in uh, for the primary from the beginning, you know, and, and Bernie Sanders was never a viable candidate because of DNC. Uh, had uh, chosen to elevate Hillary Clinton. And uh, we brought them to court on a theory that uh, of, um, that the donors to the Bernie Sanders campaign were defrauded, just like anybody who you know contributes to a, uh, a false enterprise, be it a Ponzi scheme or you know a, you know a boiler room stock scheme, or what have you, you know, who gets defrauded, you know, they would have standing to bring uh, a claim for being defrauded under common law, along with other claims that are related, um, you know, based on uh, the DNC's conduct. And, uh, you know, we, we thought it was a pretty straightforward um, a theory of the case. And, you know, the whole idea was, well, I mean, first of all, we just had so much uh, outrage uh, from people who had uh, put a lot of time and effort into the Bernie campaign. And my wife and I were uh, two of those people. I mean, we were running like, well, you know, what they called burn storms out of our office, you know, to get people to, uh, to vote for Bernie Sanders. And, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of energy and interest, you know, in, in bringing a case at the time. And, you know, it, it was a, from my point of view, it was a pretty uh, straightforward legal theory, and so we brought it as a class action in Fort Lauderdale in the uh, Southern District of Florida, which is uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz's district. And, uh, you know, after we filed suit, some strange, really strange things, you know, started happening, uh, including the, the suspicious death of our process server. And, uh, you know, that happened... You know, I think it was a few weeks uh, after the Seth Rich murder happened. And so, uh, you know, aside from, you know, the merits of the claims in the lawsuit, I mean, this case has had uh, uh, developments that, you know, to this day, uh, we, we don't have any answers as to what the heck went on um, in those events. And, uh, you know, um, in terms of the lawsuit itself, uh, um, we had a couple hearings uh, in front of Judge Locke in, uh, uh, the, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, the federal judge. Uh, and uh, the first hearing was actually um, on an issue related to serving uh, the complaint, uh, the, the pro uh, our, our process server who, uh, you know, at the time we had the hearing, um, he had already been uh, uh, found uh, deceased on his uh, bathroom floor by his girlfriend, and uh, he, you know, we uh, we had a hearing to establish that he had correctly served process on the DNC, and you know the hearing was packed with people and interest um, in in the case and in what was going on, uh, specifically with Sean Lucas. And uh, then we had another hearing after that, after the service of process issue was resolved that dealt, uh, you know, more with the merits of the claims, actually entirely dealt with the merits of the claims. And Judge Slock had a very long hearing 
uh, in which he, uh, um, you know, asked a series of, uh, you know, questions that he had obviously pre-prepared, um, and he gave the attorneys uh, uh, quite a lot of time to, uh, you know, make make the arguments, and he was very, uh, um, kept emphasizing that we had as much time as we needed uh, to explain our positions, and, uh, you know, some very, I think, uh, important things uh, came out of that hearing, including, um, you know, the fact that the DNC believes that it can rig an election and that it has that power to do so. So it makes no, uh, it makes no apologies for this. It doesn't even seek to hide this fact. You know, and its lawyers got up and said that with a straight, or its lawyer, Bruce Spiva, got up and said that with a straight face in court. And I found that to be sort of a seminal moment in this case when I realized that, you know, maybe um, this problem that we have in front of us with, uh, you know, that was, you know, at at the time started, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, this class action on behalf of Bernie Sanders donors, you know, maybe there are, you know, much deeper problems going on in our political system and our society uh, than just than, than our legal system can really handle. I don't know if you want me to keep going on, uh, guys, or if you have any questions. I mean, I'm happy to take any questions you have. I mean, I can go on and on and on about this topic. I, I do have one question. Um... Yeah, uh, and I think this is one that many people uh, have: is um, if there is any aspect of the case currently pending. Oh yeah, no. Um, so eventually, uh, the case was uh, dismissed. Uh, Judge Locke wrote a long order uh, uh, concluding that we didn't have standing to bring claims uh, against the DNC for. Uh, fraud, and, uh, you know, we appealed that to the 11th Circuit. Um, In December, uh, we had, you know, another hearing, this time in front of a three-judge appellate uh, panel in Miami. Um, It was a very, I thought it was a very good hearing, Um, and it was a very interesting hearing, and the judges asked some interesting questions on both sides. I mean, you can hear the oral argument on the 11th uh, Circuit. Uh, website if you want Um, but uh, you know as of today you know no order has been issued so we're waiting for the appellate court to uh, uh, to uh, to issue its decision oh it's still so it's still pending that that, that's a a question a lot of people I know activists like myself or whatever have uh, have one one I know a lot of people were asking have been asking that question they some people think the whole thing is dead by now, totally, to the point where there's nothing even ongoing about the case anymore. And I think that's why it's important that I ask that question, you know. Yeah. Well, no, the case is is, uh, is, is pending. We had our uh, oral argument in, in, uh, in uh, December, and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's not unusual for, uh, you know, um, for uh, appellate courts to take take some time before they issue decisions, um, you know, I will say this. You know, we had many many people at the hearing on Sean Luke, uh, the, the process of service. Um, we also had a fair number of people, uh, you know, um, at the motion to dismiss hearing. But you know, only actually one person showed up uh, to the appellate hearing from the public who had any interest in the case. So. You know, we've gotten the word out there. I mean, you know, we've sunk our resources into this case. I mean, the information is publicly available. Um, you know, you know, I, I'm kind of, you know, part of my disillusionment with the process is that, you know, I mean, if either people are interested in something and they're committed to it or they're not. Um, you know, I, I feel like, uh, you know, this was, there are issues that are not going to be solved by a lawsuit in this country, um, and you know, I, I certainly, uh, you know, would never, uh, you know, I. Well, I'll just say this. I, you know, the, the issues I think that that are going on in this country go far 
uh, deeper than what a lawsuit could solve. And, uh, you know, it's uh, maybe taking me a while to understand that, but, you know, that's where I am today. Jerry, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I think so, that's such an honest assessment, so I appreciate that. Go well, ahead, now, what I was going to say, Jerry, is that here in Canada, uh, where I'm from, uh, there was a think yeah. tank, there's an economic think tank that actually took the Bank of Canada to court. And the reason why, uh, to, to simplify it, was that they wanted the Bank of Canada to act the way it did before 74. And, and essentially, the Bank of Canada would loan money interest-free to all the provinces, so there would be no debt. And then the IMF came in 74, persuaded our prime minister, who's actually the current prime minister's uh, son, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the Tr Trudeau's dad back in 74, and convinced them that there was too much stagflation uh, to change it. So anyways, they changed it, uh, and uh, all the money that was loaned out from the, from the Bank of Canada was actually from private lenders, which ballooned our, um, our interest. To make a long story short, Jared, this think tank went to all three levels of government, and when they got to the end, they lost. <clears throat> so it's kind of related to this case in a way that it seems to me that, I mean, the system, the, the justice system, that's, I don't even know if we can call it a justice system anymore. It doesn't seem like a justice system anymore. It's not really for the people. Uh, I mean, right. is there any truth to that? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, my wife and I talk about this every day. I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, you know, you can imagine how depressing it is from the perspective of a lawyer who wants, you know, to, to just, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm not asking for, you know, some utopian paradise here. Okay. I mean, I just, at this point, I, I would be very happy with like a functional legal system, but I'm, I'm fearing that we're, maybe past that point in a lot of areas. Some areas are worse than others. I mean, I think the criminal justice system is an absolute mess. I mean, I have many, many um, uh, friends in the profession who are extremely depressed and disillusioned and pretty much dropping out of, of the practice. Um, you know, people who are very, very talented who, you know, went to top law schools. Um, and, uh, you know, really... Um, you know, the, the Florida Bar just issued a, uh, a, a, a mental health sur uh, survey of uh, young lawyers, and, you know, 59% believe the profession is becoming increasingly un it is, it is an undesirable profession. Uh, so, you know, this is a, you know, there's an extraordinary amount of unhappiness in the legal profession. I think it mostly stems from the fact that the system is uh, so damaged and so debilitated. I mean, it's the end of the day, your legal system is just like any other piece of the infrastructure of your society. You have to put, uh, you know, capital into it to maintain it consistently, just like you do with your roads and so forth. Um, and if you don't put that investment up, uh, then, you know, your infrastructure deteriorates. And I think that's where we are with our legal system, and I think it's systematic. I mean, I can't really speak for Canada, uh, but... Um, you know, that's at least the situation in the U.S. Well, Jared, I think uh, one of the things that I think is um, important uh, for people to hear, uh, your frustration with, the, with, with it and being actually in the field is actually helpful for people to hear because it gives an honest assessment that some people that are in a particular profession, they ra do so much rationalizing you don't get that straight, direct honesty that we get from you, which is one of the things I particularly like about you. And on top, on top of that, the other thing I like is that you seem to be a person who's principled enough that you're not, you're not devoted to money at the cost of all your ethics. And you demonstrated that in some of the things you've said. And I think people look at you and they say, an ethical lawyer, that is something that is really, uh, it's very pleasant for people to hear that there is a lawyer that holds some standard for ethics that goes beyond simply being a lawyer, but as a human being. It's a, it's a, it's a very, to, to people, it's very meaningful to hear something like that. 
Well, um, you know, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, I mean, that kind of makes me sad um, to hear it, that, that it would actually simply by, you know, enunciating what I, I think are fairly straightforward principles um, of ethics and morality, you know, uh, you know, it, it's something that is, is, is unusual or, or to be noted rather than something that is, you know, normal and to be expected. Well, I, and, I think, uh, you know I what think, I'm saying? Yeah, I think people in general do have some sense of morality that they do, but I think a lot of it has been in people is, is that part of the character has become somewhat uh, suppressed because, uh, not because <clears> people <throat> are apathetic, but because people feel hopeless. So right. hopeless. Hopelessness has made some of the better parts of people's character has suppressed the better part of many people's character. I, I don't think that that's totally missing in people, but I, I, no, it's, I, it's I, not. It's not totally missing. Um, I think what you're describing is is um, is you know the symptoms of, of, of people that have been abused in some way. And I yep. think we've all sort of been abused by, you know, in a large way by, by our governments, um, which, you know, are, you know, uh, you know, like it or not, you know, your government is, is a sort of paternal figure um, in, in your life, in your psychological makeup. And so um, when, when, when your government sort of lies again and again over time and tries to make you feel worthless and insignificant, um, which I think it does, and I think lawyers are a sort of a conduit for that in a lot of ways um, as a profession um, because it has sort of an interest in the status quo, and that's why, um, you know, people have become extraordinarily jaded as to the, as the legal profession, as you described. Um, but you're, you're right. I mean, I think it's a natural reaction to sort of become sort of like hopeless and, um, and, and, and extraordinarily cynical, but it's not a great... It's not a great um, prognosticator of, of social cohesion, right? But I also yeah, think, I think that it's it's keeping it, it's. I I feel that people are um, not only feeling a sense of, of hopelessness, but uh, they're, they're also desperate, and yeah. they're also desperate to cling on to this two-party political system, and, and it's three-party here in Canada. And, and again, there's that saying, you know, the, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So with that, with that said, Jared, I mean, when people say to you, for 2020, you know, let's support Bernie, what is your reaction? Oh, well, uh, you, know, uh, 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 um, you know, I've gone through a few phases on that. Uh, you know, uh, I think initially my reaction was anger. Um, and I think the anger that I felt and, you know, I think if you followed me on social media at the time, you know, this is where a lot of my, you know, social media persona was formed, uh, was in this very angry phase. Uh, and that came from my, um, you know, role as an advocate and a, uh, uh, plaintiff's counsel, you know, here I am, you know, fighting this fraud suit on behalf of, uh, thousands upon thousands of Bernie donors who were just defrauded. And, and here we have like a bunch of people going around in the face of all this refutable evidence that the DNC will uh, choose the candidate ahead of time. And, you know, you, you actually want people to like spend more money and time and effort on this. Um, and so, you know, I, I felt very angry. I felt very justified in my anger. Um, but, you know, I've come to sort of, a different point on that, uh, you know, um, to your question is how, how I react to that now. And, and I don't think I react with that kind of anger now. Um, I'm, I, I'm more, more resigned to the fact that, um, you know, as you say, um, you know, there's a lot of programming um, for people to hold on to these political systems because they've been ingrained in our socio-political identities. Uh, and I'm sort of resigned that people are going to do it. Um, I think it's, you know, it's going to be a, it's, it's a personal choice at this point, what you want to do with your time and your energy and where you want to direct your energies and resources. I mean, you know, far be it for me to, to, to stop anyone. Uh, you know, I'm personally, you know, not going to be, you know, spending my time or energy, you know, supporting candidates. 
in any uh, political election in the U.S. from this point forward and not really spending any time watching it any more than, you know, I, I, I pay attention to the World Wide Wrestling Federation or whatever it's called. I mean, some people do. They get a lot of joy out of it, um, you know. Uh, and I, you know, went through a phase as a kid when I watched the WWF and I really enjoyed it. But, you know, that's not a part of my life anymore. And, you know, I think U.S. politics is the same thing. Again, I can't speak for Canada, but, uh, you know, that's where I am. I'm at with it, you know. Oh, you, you know, uh, one thing, uh, uh, because, Jared, the first time, you know, I spoke to you, so, you know, on uh, in a conversation here. So uh, maybe I'll give you a little background about how I got involved in the whole Bernie thing. Uh, I okay. mean, I... I'm by profession. By profession, I'm a, a, a martial art teach, a martial art and Zen teacher, and I've been doing this for, hmm. you know, about 40 years. Um, wow. I got involved in political stuff because I found that ethics was one part of martial arts that I felt was, even though it had it was traditionally part of some aspect of martial arts training, it wasn't really. Um, uh, emphasized by anybody, and um, in my school, I felt if I didn't focus on that, then I, I felt like, why am I teaching people to be strong or tough when they're not actually necessarily on the right side of things? So very early on, I decided I would not teach the military and I would not teach the police a <laughs> martial art. Uh, so I, I made sure, and, and very a lot of martial art people have actually tried to get business from because that's good money but I decided yeah. no I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to support people who vote for you know who work for the wrong side and yeah. then I started on on Facebook I started a group called the World Community Action League that was my first you know thing of trying to be involved in political stuff and when Bernie came along I thought okay let me see if we can use him as a vehicle to push certain issues that don't get any press so mm -hmm. I noticed that he was getting some press, and but very early in, on in the campaign, I noticed there were weird things that he was doing that led me to think that we have to watch him closely like a hawk, because I yeah. said, this, this bastard's going to turn on us, I was thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. Even in the beginning of the campaign, I started concerning myself with that. And, um, and I noticed he did things like, I mean, the the thing with the email that I didn't even pay too much mind to about him blowing off the the, the significance of the email, but right. but every, every state where we got kind of where illegal stuff happened, and he blew it off as if it was insignificant right. or or he didn't want to hear anything about it, and uh, the person who documented the 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 what do you call the illegal activity that was going on that did a good job of that. I mean, I, I, I was a uh, Debbie Lusignan, the one that called herself sane progressive. She did a good job. Yes. of documenting that. So I, I give her credit for that. She did a wonderful job of documenting all the different stuff that, that was going on in every state. And I remember Arizona, they went from 200 to 600 polling places and people standing in five and six hour line lines and all kinds of stuff and people being, Purged off of the vote, uh, off of the, the voting, uh, uh, what, it, what you know, their voting rights were, were, were erased or whatever. So all the stuff that was going on, and I, and I noticed Bernie's reaction to it, and I said, this is trouble. And also, even some mm -hmm. of the things he said bothered me because you know how I said I don't teach police and military, and then Bernie right. Sanders would come out and he would say when dealing with uh, issues about the police. You know, he would talk about how most police officers are good people, and uh, it's just you know, it, it's it's a it's a few. It's just most of them are good are good people. I said this is bullshit. I would not have ha took, taken that policy on as early as the the early '80s if that was true. So I thought this guy mm -hmm. knows better than that. So that means his that his ethical standards are too damn low for me to trust him. So I started to distrust him, even though I did thousands of posts on 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 Facebook to promote him. I did, I literally did thousands. I was in every Bernie group. I pumped it like you wouldn't believe it. I was doing this day and night for the, through the whole campaign. I still pushed for him, but I warned people when he did something weird. 
And <laughs> remember the one where the child porn was put on a bunch of groups and they shut down like 13 or 15 groups? No, um, no. Hillary campaign, Hillary's campaign, some people had put child porn onto groups and Facebook, instead of going after those people, they shut the groups down and that was a before a Super Tuesday. Well, okay. I was one of the people that made sure the groups got back up again. I urged people to report it to FBI or whatever, uh, you know, because I thought this was interfering with the election. And yet, you know, all of these different things, uh, almost everything that went wrong, Bernie didn't back it up. And he said he would contest the convention, and he didn't do that at all. He blew, mm -hmm. he betrayed people, and people said, well, he, he has to follow the rules of the DNC is that he's supposed to support whatever the nominee is. Well, guess mm -hmm. what? When all kinds of illegal activity happens, those rules for him to comply are null and void. So that's a stupid argument. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't say, oh, you know, I uh, I'm going to go with whoever wins the nomination, even though uh, it was done with a whole bunch of illegal activity. It's just the most. It's absurd for him to take that position, and it's absurd for people to protect Bernie on that. At least that's that. Anyway, that's my background. And Nick, Nick is. Uh, I don't know. Nick, Nick, can you give a real quick? Uh, I don't know if uh, if if uh, Jared knows your background and what you're trying to do because you're a direct democracy guy that that is pushing for. The, the citizens initiative referendum it is uh, perhaps it's, yeah it's, it's, it, this is something that uh well i mean uh, first off jared uh, direct democracy has been around um for for many years uh in particular in, in the country of switzerland and uh, i mean a lot of people have come to the realization that uh in order to 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 move society in the right direction we can't depend on on political parties to do that because you know they're only going to worry about their own self-interest and their donors. And so what I uh, you know what I've been um, promoting amongst uh, many other people is the idea of giving the citizens on every state uh, on on every level of government excuse me the the power to to um, start you know start up initiatives and to try to get. Uh, laws either passed or or not passed through referendums. Um, so I mean that's that's something that uh, that we've been uh, you know I mean there's there's been initiatives in the states apparently out of out of uh, the I don't know 50 states there's about 20 to 22 of them that have direct democracy laws enshrined in their local state constitution. But there's there's been this subversion by mainstream politics. To try to keep that buried, so that well, again, also they won't they won't allow it to be uh, implemented. Either. That's right. That's, that's right. They they don't want these. Uh, essentially, they don't want people to to have the power. They don't want people to have the direct say on a lot of the laws that, that get passed or that get removed. So that's that's essentially that what we're we're you know what we're trying to do for the last five years. But with that said, Jared, do you have any last things that you want to say that you want to mention? No, just, uh, you know, it was nice talking to you with you guys. I appreciate your, your questions and your interests and your, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the projects you're working on, and, and thanks for having me on the show. Um, so, uh, uh, well, Jared, thank you. thank you so much for doing this.